Part one of this three-part presentation about the Bluebell dealt with its identity. Part two will be about its structure, its progress from seed to adult, and its annual cycle from the first flushing of its leaves via flowering, seed production and senescence, to its apparent dormancy between summer and early spring as a bulb. I say apparent dormancy because this plant takes a break of about two weeks each summer before becoming active again, unseen below ground. Part three will discuss relationships between bluebells and their symbiotic fungi, a very special, intimate, life-sustaining association known as mycorrhiza. A single bluebell plant is a bulb composed of compact white flesh and has at its base a domed disc of a stem upon which roots, two colourless leaf sheaths, green leaves and scapes, the flower stalks, are all born. Unlike onions, daffodils and the like, it is completely rebuilt every season, as we shall see. This drawing of a section through woodland soil showing the positions of bluebell bulbs is taken from a publication by long-time president of Huddersfield Naturalist Society, Thomas William Woodhead, 1863 to 1949. As far as I can tell, Woodhouse has been the only person to report comprehensively on the natural history of bluebell from first-hand observation. The pear-shaped bulbs of adult plants are located 25 to 30 centimetres down in the soil in the humic mineral, or AH, horizon, where nutrients are available but by no means plentiful. A place that is safe, if not ideal for feeding, but just right for a mycorrhizal plant, discussed in part three of this video sequence. Bluebells are often seen as a continuous sward, but before they reach that density, plants have to have been individuals from a single seed. Later they become tightly packed clumps, which may go on to coalesce. When at the individual clump stage, the group will be clonal, derived by the division of the original bulb and therefore all of the same genetic makeup. That is, except when a seed of different parentage arrives and succeeds in germinating, maturing and working its way down among the established adult bulbs to join the clonal clump it has invaded. This old illustration of a single naked bluebell is remarkably accurate, except the root system is unnatural, with all of the roots short and dangling. In real life, the roots tend to spread, many horizontally, some diving downward, and a few reaching up into the organic humic OH and leaf litter OO horizons, where nutrients are more plentiful. In order for the French artist to paint this completely exposed plant, it would have been necessary to dig it up and wash its fragile roots free of soil. They are so brittle that many would have broken and become lost, leaving only short lengths to be illustrated as here. When wet, the remaining attached fragments will have tended to droop, adhering in a bunch. The artist has arranged them neatly, but was unable to represent their spread or orientations in the soil. This picture perhaps illustrates that artist's difficulties. Only after examining below-ground aspects of bluebells very many times have I been able to assemble a mental model of the root system. But because the roots are so much a part of the soil and extremely brittle, illustrating them in three dimensions for others to imagine would require a botanist familiar with the subject who is also a very good artist. And that's not me. The next best is try to provide a more or less persuasive explanation with the inadequate tools, words and camera. To humans, who because of the opaqueness of the soil are unable to see anything that happens below ground, Bluebell's so-called dormant period seems to last from early summer until early spring, when the leaves begin to appear. However, what we don't see is the roots emerging from the bulb near its base where the stem is situated, sometime during August. Then is the real start of the Bluebell year and continuous activity until next July. The roots drill their way through the bulb tissue from their origins on the stem and grow out into the soil. They are immediately invaded by a benign mycorrhizal fungus, which grows through the root tissues from the apex back towards the bulbs as they grow. The fungus never actually enters the bulb, inhabiting only the soil and the invaded roots. This remarkable symbiotic association will be explained in part three. 
In late summer or early autumn, the shoot, which originates on top of the stem disc, emerges from the narrow apex of the bulb. It has already been present for two or three months, but in a highly condensed form, hidden from human awareness inside the bulb. If in July one carefully cuts off the base of a bulb, just above where the root buds are, showing as minute pimples on the surface, the conical shoot can be drawn out. It is possible to peel that leaf by leaf, revealing the next year's leaves and inflorescence. The minute flower buds may be seen and even counted. Here's how it's done. Gently but firmly roll the bulb between the index finger and thumb, just above the cut surface, and the conical shoot will gradually emerge. Next, roll the shoot cone in the same way as you rolled the bulb, so that the sheaths and the leaves emerge. Then they may be separated, leaf by leaf, so that the next year's leaves may be counted, and on the inflorescence at the centre, even the minute next year's flowers can be teased apart for counting. Unseen below ground from September, the shoots grow slowly upwards through the soil profile. Sometime around midwinter, they all stop growing just below the soil surface. The two white leaf sheaths that still enclose the green leaves are light sensitive, and as soon as they detect the world above and measure the short day length, they inhibit further growth. Sometime in January, the sheaths sense increasing day length and release their hold over the shoots, which burst through them and before long we become aware of the bright green rosettes of leaves that confirm that, refreshingly like when the swallows return from Africa, the bluebells are back. For a couple of months, the bluebells are working hard, taking advantage of all the daylight for photosynthesis, growth and reproduction, before the leaves on the trees create unfavourable shade, which signals it's time for senescence to begin. During this time of maximum growth and nutrient uptake, as the shoot withdraws nourishment stored in the bulb, the bulb itself deteriorates, becoming mushy. However, as soon as the leaves begin photosynthesizing, they partition food down to the stem upon which the new bulb, next year's, begins to form inside the remains of the old. As the new bulb swells within, the old one shrivels. By early summer, the old bulb will be no more than a dry husk surrounding the plump new one. This rather unprepossessing illustration, sorry, I don't have any better, charts the reallocation of resources within whole plants growing in a natural woodland setting. Isolated clumps of bluebells were dug up, with permission and carefully considered clear conscience, washed and the individuals divided into their various parts, root old bulb and new bulb, leaves and inflorescences. While root subsamples were set aside for the mycorrhiza study reported in part three, as much information as possible was obtained from those various plant parts, which when analyzed revealed a great deal of new knowledge about how bluebells function. Note how biomass, dry weight, and phosphorus content of the various parts changes over the growing period from September until June. In particular, we can see the old bulb's decline and disappearance as it relinquishes its stored nutrient content to build leaves, flowers, roots and the new bulb, which at the end of the season is all that remains. We tend to take little notice of bluebells until they begin flowering, depending on latitude, around mid-April. May is bluebell time, when the British acknowledge their fondness for what is arguably their favourite wildflower. Ian Wright, a gardens advisor for the National Trust, wrote, Wander down to a wood in April or early May, and it's likely that you'll be confronted by a wonderful sight. A carpet of blue will stretch out into the distance with a scene full of delicate, fragile flowers. A bluebell wood in full flower is a true assault on our senses. Who can disagree, I say? The flowers are pollinated by large insects, bees in particular, Perhaps examine some individual flowers closely. You might find a tiny hole at the base of the bell, evidence of a cheating bee that has drilled into the flower to collect its nectar while avoiding the hard work of pollination. As fertilisation progresses and the fruits begin to set, the leaves senesce. They become yellow and limp. Eventually the leaves become slimy and rotten, then desiccated, crisp and brown, before disappearing within the leaf litter. A significant proportion of leaf biomass and nutrients are withdrawn as the leaves wither, 
to nourish the new bulb. They recycle. Various aspects of its life history show Bluebell to be the master of economy, as we shall see when we examine fruiting behaviour. At this time, senescence, the roots shrivel and become non-functional. Eventually, all that remains alive are the bulbs, apparently dormant but not really, until the following January to February, when we who live above ground witness leaf emergence. Above ground, only the old flowering spikes remain visible, retaining their seeds in upturned open pods until scattered by a gust of wind, a passing badger or rabbit, or <laughs> carried away on a bluebell researcher's clothing. The seeds are large and heavy, not designed to travel very far. So like the rest of its lifestyle, bluebell distribution requires ecological stability and plenty of time. That bluebells have a period of dormancy June to February is the generally held view, but anyone studying below ground aspects of bluebell biology will tell you that with this plant, dormancy is a myth. The bluebell researcher who is pursuing a time course study may allow him or herself no more than two weeks summer holiday or risk misunderstanding important features of the bluebell's annual cycle. There is a lot more to bluebell flowering than meets the casual eye. When in bud, the flowers stand upright, tightly packed, and the strap-shaped, leaf-like bracts that protect them, usually a paler blue than the flowers they enclose. Escapes, surmounted by their terminal spindle-shaped knots of buds, are expanding vertically out of the leaf rosette. The buds separate, nod and open, one by one, and we are delighted. The first to open is the lowest, at the base of the inflorescence, and opening continues in sequence upwards, taking several weeks to complete. As the flowers nod and open in sequence, the scape stretches and bends so that the entrance to every pollination-ready flower is pointing downwards. Why? Somebody must have done the research, you would think. Several monocotyledonous spring flowers, snowdrop, daffodil, bluebell, are upright in bud, nod and open when they are ready for insects to visit, and then, when fertilised, they rise again. Yes, after fertilisation, the flowers rise, beginning with the lowest, or first fertilised, and as they do so in series, and as the fruits swell and begin to ripen, the scapes gradually straighten, from the lowest flower level to the apex. The inflorescence has now adopted the attitude it had before the buds opened, but it is much longer, with the fruits set well apart. Why the flowers should point upwards as they prepare their seeds is more obvious than why they nod when opening. Upright, with the opening at the top, the seeds will be retained until a gust of wind or a suitable animal vector brushes past them, a haphazard but surprisingly effective way of achieving dispersal. I wonder if the mechanism in the flower stalks that lowers and raises the flowers has ever been studied. Here is the complete sequence from closed buds to empty pods. If any individual flower has not been fertilised, its fruit doesn't develop, and a remarkable thing happens. Another of Bluebell's economy strategies. The inflorescence is aborted upwards from the lowest viable fruit, which is retained along with any higher than itself. The remaining scape and unfertilised flowers are simply thrown away. Creating and maintaining fruit and seeds is a resource-hungry process, so this might be a way of avoiding wastage, unused nutrients reallocated to the now fully formed new bulb. 1. If all flowers on a scape are fertilised, the entire scape and fruits are retained. 2. If top and bottom flowers only are fertilised, the entire scape is retained. 3. If only the topmost flower is fertilised, still the entire scape is retained, with wizard flower remains all the way up to the triumphant inflated green terminal pot. 4. If only the lowest flower is fertilised, the rest of the scape above it aborts. 
Five, if no flowers on a scape are fertilised, the entire scape aborts. That happens to many of them. Six, if a few randomly positioned flowers have been fertilised, the scape is retained up to the highest successful fruit above which the scape withers. It is an ideally economical, one might be tempted to say almost intelligent, strategy. Before the seeds are released, the trilocular bluebell fruits are inflated, succulent and green, if in the open with a bluish flush. The pods dry out during July, eventually splitting three ways across the top so that the seeds are retained in their little cups until blown or otherwise jolted out during August and September. Bluebells shed their seed onto the surface of the leaf litter during high summer. They are large, 2-3 to three millimetres across, black, relatively heavy items which have no ingenious mechanism that enables them to travel, as do numerous other plants, such as dandelion, a parachute, sycamore, a wing, clematis, all feathery, burdock with hooks, and balsam, explosive. They stay in their upright pods until physically disturbed by a badger or whatever. Mostly they simply fall onto the ground, many landing close to the parent plant, so bluebell spread is gradual. But given time, it obviously happens. Bluebell seeds have very specific requirements for germination. Firstly, they must come to life in the autumn of their production or die. Whereas many plant seeds last for years or decades in the soil, there are no bluebells in the seed bank. Next, the seeds must fall onto dry leaf litter and undergo a degree of baking over the summer. Then they require autumn's falling leaves to bury them and rain to dampen the resulting leaf litter and begin its decomposition. This process soon makes a nutritious mulch, a rudimentary seed growing compost. Seeds suitably inspired by summer heat, followed by autumn burial and mulching by falling leaves, germinate. In spring, within the moist leaf litter, the seed bursts allowing the cotyledon to extend. At its end, a single little root grows out, which dives energetically down into the moist litter, heading for the soil. Next, the first hair-like leaf, botanists call it a cetaceous leaf, emerges from a small aperture in the cotyledon, and now that nutrient acquisition has begun, the seedling begins to build its first tiny bulb. As soon as there's a root, something surprising happens. In common with the majority of plants, adult bluebells interact with a community of soil fungi which penetrate their roots to form the symbiosis mycorrhiza. This is explained more fully in part three of this series, but for now we may understand that the fungi forage in the soil for nutrients on behalf of the bluebells, notably phosphate, which the plants are physically unable to collect for themselves. As soon as the tiny seedling rootlet is an inch or so in length, a soil fungus invades it with its microscopic fibres, called hyphae, feeding the tiny bluebell from its life's beginning, as it and other similar fungi will continue to do throughout the adult bluebell's life, apart from during that brief period of summer semi-dormancy. In the wild, mortalities over the first few seasons are colossal, so that only approximately 1.5% of baby bluebells survive their first two seasons from germination until the two-leaf stage. Such mortalities are quite usual in nature, preventing overpopulation, facilitating natural selection, and therefore, over time, evolution, which of course, on the human time scale, we are unable to witness. So, to begin with, the little bluebell's journey down the soil profile is hazardous. But within two or three seasons, the survivors have arrived in a place of relative safety, if at a depth of only a few centimetres. They undergo a number of changes en route and have special mechanisms that enable them to hurry. Having embarked upon a young life of bulb construction, even as seedlings, the little bluebells adopt two methods for pulling themselves down through the soil, contractile roots and bulb elongation relocation. The single contractile root, occasionally two, is thicker than standard feeding roots and is capable, once grown, of gripping the soil, crumpling and shortening itself with enough strength to pull the bulb downward. Often, the bulb itself has become long and thin, which probably helps it to make the change of position by being more streamlined, or rather, less unstreamlined. When elongating downwards, 
Some of the bulk of the little bulb is transferred to the lower end of the extension while the upper parts shrink. A round bulb becomes a long bulb, swollen top and bottom, translocates itself to a deeper level and then becomes a round bulb once again. In this unfortunately rather fuzzy photograph from a controlled experiment, the bulb has been caught in the act of performing this remarkable feat. The base of the little round bulb, when last seen six months previously, was adjacent to the lower edge of the small yellow marker. It is translocating by approximately six centimetres and has also been pulled down by its contractile root, the distance between the marker and the top of the bulb, where it currently is, about 1.5 centimetres. By the next examination, it had become rounded again and larger, with its base a little lower even than it is now, having travelled almost 10 centimetres down the soil profile in a single season. After about year five, as the bluebells mature, their bulbs divide, eventually forming clumps of clonal descendants known as ramets. Bulbs may divide into two equal daughter bulbs, two unequal daughter bulbs, or even, occasionally, up to 30 variously sized mini bulbs, which revert to seedling behaviour, elongating, pulling themselves to a comfortable level in the soil, and regrowing to maturity. As the clump increases and bulbs become overcrowded, some get squeezed upwards. With their ability to revert to juvenile behaviour, they simply elongate and pull themselves down with contractile roots. If the ecological conditions allow, clumps gradually spread, both vegetatively and by seed, until they coalesce to form a sward. During my research, it was obvious, without question, that bluebells reproduce vegetatively by bulb division all the time. I was surprised, therefore, when I read that vegetative reproduction in the bluebell is absent, rare, or at best, infrequent. Considering the number of paintings that depict gentle scenes of people gathering bluebells, it has evidently been a popular pastime, though nowadays, as a general conservation rule, not recommended. Independently, in the 1930s, two botanists, T.R. Peace of the Imperial Forestry Institute, Oxford, and John Gilmore of Cambridge Botanical Garden, intrigued by the commonly held belief that picking bluebells lessened their flowering capacity in future years, were dissatisfied with what was clearly unqualified rumour and decided to start experiments to test it. Each scientist experimented with four treatments. One, untreated control. Two, snapped off at ground level. Three, pulled so the entire flowering stalk including its white lower part down to the bulb, was removed. Four, heavily trampled. Peace's results showed that neither picking nor pulling had any deleterious effect on the production of flowers over a period of five years, while Gilmore concluded that the general condition of the plants remained more or less unchanged throughout the eight years of picking. The trampled areas showed a progressive deterioration until there were only a few scattered plants, many of them not flowering. Therefore, the widely held opinion that picking bluebells harms the plants was falsified. It is the feet of the pickers that do the damage. Peace and Gilmore proffered the advice that no harm can be done by moderate picking or pulling, preferably spread over a wide area rather than intensively in one spot, provided all unnecessarily trampling on leaves is avoided. It is best to pick in a spot where the plants are thinly scattered, as it is easier here to avoid trampling on the leaves.